Hi, everyone. I'm Chelsea Wood. My preferred pronouns are she, her, and I'm a member of the faculty at UW's School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences. Now, I'm a parasite ecologist, which means that I study the creepy crawly organisms that live in or on fishes, but also other hosts, including people. More on that in just a sec. Here's a photo of me looking very proper and respectable, but I am much more comfortable outdoors. I'm a field biologist and my work has taken me all over the world. I've done research projects on parasites in ponds of central California, which is where I am in this photo. I've worked on parasites of coral reef fishes in the central Pacific. I've researched human parasites in West Africa and I've even dabbled a little bit in viruses in Bangladesh. But my very favorite places are closer to home. So I've also got lots of research projects that focus right here on the parasites of Puget Sound. I teach a couple of different classes. I'm the instructor for fisheries ecology, a required course for the aquatic and fishery sciences major and an elective for other folks. In this course, we learn the basics of ecology and take three awesome field trips, including two research cruises. This is a photo of some of our students sorting the contents of a trawl on our Puget Sound research cruise. I also teach parasite ecology in which students are introduced to the wonderful world of parasites. Here, one student is measuring the length of a human roundworm. And finally, I teach a seminar course in historical ecology, which is basically the ecology of past ecosystems. It can be tricky to figure out what an ecosystem looked like 50, 100, 200 years ago, but historical ecology gives us the tools to unearth that lost information. Now today, I wanna to teach you a different but very important lesson. It's important both because it'll teach you something about parasites, but also because it might save you some suffering down the road. Here I present how to enjoy sushi without getting infested by parasites. Now the average resident of Washington state eats fish about once a month and often when a Washingtonian is sitting down to a fish meal it looks like this. Rates of sushi consumption have absolutely skyrocketed in recent years and with those rising rates of consumption we've been seeing more frequent occurrences of this problem. There are worms in your sushi. Now, if I'm being honest, there are worms in everything that you eat, everything. But cooking kills the whole menagerie of parasites living in your food. It's only when we consume uncooked or undercooked food that we wind up tangling with live and infectious parasites. Here's one. Uh, this is an anisacid nematode, and usually we deal with two different species, Anisacus simplex and Pseudoterranova decipiens. Now you might find this revolting and I don't think that you're alone, but these parasites are actually really amazing animals. And when you eat them, you get to participate in a natural cycle that connects you to plankton and fish and whales um, and connects right back to you. These worms start their lives in the intestine of a marine mammal. They're pooped out and hatched in the water column where they get eaten by a first intermediate host crustacean who's eaten by a second intermediate host fish who's eaten by a definitive host marine mammal, completing the life cycle. We call these complex life cycles because they involve multiple hosts. Now, humans get involved when we accidentally eat these fish that are intended to end up in the guts of marine mammals. And when we do, those worms can wind up wreaking havoc in our intestines. When a person becomes infected with anisacid worms, we call that disease anisakiasis, and there are a couple of symptoms abdominal pain, nausea, diarrhea, and vomiting. And if you're a frequent sushi eater, you'll recognize all of these symptoms as being consistent with food poisoning. Anisakiasis mimics food poisoning in its symptoms and it can be confused for food poisoning. And in fact, I work with a physician over in the UW School of Public Health who estimates that about one third of the incidence of food poisoning from sushi consumption are actually anisakiasis. So if you've ever thrown up a little bit after eating sushi, there is a 33% chance that you are throwing up because this is what's happening in your intestine. This is a picture that was taken by an endoscope or a camera that was fed down someone's throat and into their stomach and then through to their intestinal tract. And through endoscopy, we can make diagnoses of anisakiasis. Here you can see the worm sort of laying on the intestinal lining of this poor, um, vomiting person. And 
the worms, once they make it here, can't really do much else. They can't reproduce in a human intestinal tract. They need to be in a marine mammal intestinal tract to complete their life cycle. And so this is just a dead end for the worm. It's not going anywhere after it's in a human intestinal tract. But that doesn't mean that it can't cause some damage along the way because the human immune system recognizes this worm as not part of the human body and it attacks it. And that immune attack is what results in all the vomiting and diarrhea that comes along with anisakiasis. Now it's super hard to diagnose anisakiasis. You need to do an endoscopy. If someone is suffering a lot, that endoscopy will be done and the worms will be removed with forceps. Um, but generally people just throw up and have some diarrhea and then move on with their lives, never knowing that they've been host to one of these worms. Now you might be thinking, okay, that's bad. It's bad to have a worm in your intestine, but it's not that common, right? wrong. <laughs> it's so common, in fact, that there's an entire subgenre of YouTube videos documenting these worms in seafood, on sushi sold in restaurants, at the seafood counter, and in packaged seafood, as you see here. So how do you avoid ingesting these worms? The title of this talk made some promises and let me now deliver on those promises. If you want to enjoy sushi without getting infested by parasites, follow these three simple steps. First, keep your eyes peeled. These are big worms and they're easy to see. Cut your sushi up into little pieces before you eat it. Fish flesh, as any of you who commonly eat sushi know, has lots of strings, little veins and connective tissue. The thing that you wanna look for is movement. If it's moving, it's dangerous to you. Now, sushi chefs are specially trained to see and remove these worms. Your buddy who makes seafood at home isn't. Avoid homemade sushi. Now, if you think anisakid nematodes are bad, just wait until you find out about the parasites of freshwater fish. When you're ordering sushi, stick with marine fishes. You might be exposed to anisakids, but trust me, the freshwater alternatives are far, far worse. So sure, eating sushi is a health risk, but think about it this way. Eating these worms connects you to nature in a real and visceral way. You become part of this grand cycle that links the very lowliest species in an ocean food web to whales and dolphins, seals and sea lions. You get to experience what it's like to be part of a marine food web. Bon appetit. Curious? Want to see what one of these anisakid worms looks like in real life? Let's head over to the lab and see if we can find some. Okay, so here we are in my office. And before we run over to the lab, I just want to grab the salmon that we're going to be checking for anisakid nematodes today. So I just left it in my fridge over here. We'll check this out in just a second. I picked it up this morning from Pike Place Market. And we're going to get to see what's inside. So let's take a walk over to the lab. And during that walk, I'll get to show you a little bit of the facilities that we have here in Fishery Science Building. Okay, so we're heading to my lab, which is a parasite ecology research lab. And there we dissect fish from all over the world to understand what their parasite burdens are. Today, we're gonna be looking specifically at a salmon caught in Alaska, the king salmon. I got it from Pike Place Market, which is sometimes where we get the material that we look at in my lab. More often, we're collecting these fish from the wild. Along our way, I want to show you a little bit about what the facilities are here in the Fishery Sciences Building. Here you'll see we've got the Aquatic Sciences Undergraduate Commons. You can just come in and take a look for a second. This is a really awesome space that is designed for undergraduates to hang out in. We've got a couple of whiteboards that you can study with your friends. We've got a couple of couches so that you can take a nap between classes or relax and do your homework. This is a space for undergraduates to use um, and to be a part of the staff and college of the environment community. So, I might be the first person to have ever sat on those couches, but I certainly won't be the last, and hopefully at some point you will too. Okay, so we'll continue on to the lab. As I mentioned, we do lots of fish dissections in my lab. And our goal is to find out what the parasite burden is of those fish. We're often addressing specific scientific questions, like for example, do human impacts on the environment change the burden of parasites in fishes? 
And a lot of times we find that that's true. For this salmon in particular, you might think that finding worms in something that you're about to eat is a bad thing. And to some extent, it's probably not the best thing to eat worms. But the worms in this salmon are actually a signal that the salmon comes from a healthy ecosystem. As you saw when I spoke a couple of minutes ago, these worms have a complex life cycle that links them from the very lowliest members of the marine food web to the very highest members, the marine mammals. So the presence of these worms in the salmon really means that all of those members of the food web are present, and that's a good thing. It's a signal that the salmon comes from a place that's healthy. So let's see what we can find in this salmon filet. Here we're approaching my lab, the wood lab in the fishery science building. And here we will find Sarah Fayad, who is a graduate student in my lab, and she's also the TA for our parasite ecology course, Fish 406. I'll apologize a little bit for the lab being sort of a disaster zone. We just finished Fish 406 in fall quarter, and all of the at-home lab kits that the students had that they were using to do parasite ecology on their kitchen tables have now come back to us, and we're in the midst of organizing them. But we still have plenty of room to check out the salmon. So here we have the king salmon filet that I bought this morning at Pike Place Market. Alongside a different salmon, this is a headless sockeye salmon. Um, and we will look in the filet first and see if we can find anything. The hope is that because this fish is relatively fresh, we might be able to find some living worms in it. Um, but one way or another, we should be able to find antiseptic worms. So Sarah and I have a special method for doing this. It's highly technical and uses very fancy equipment. Um, basically, what we're going to do is take a little slice of the salmon and then place it between these two glass plates and smash it so that it's really, really thin. <laughs> then we'll pass a light through those two glass plates and we'll see silhouetted by the light any worms that might be inside of that salmon muscle. So we'll take our first little cut now. light that I purchased from Ikea <laughs> to pass the light through the stem. We haven't had much luck with the king salmon. I'm going to switch over to the sockeye and see what we can do. Okay, I see something a little suspicious on this one. Gently, gently tease the muscle away. And voila. Nice, long sushi worm. There he is in all of his glory. That is 
the head end of the worm. Curled around. Now there is the tail. They have a little mouth right here. Of course, they're larvae, so they're not doing a lot of eating. They're quiescent or kind of in hibernation in their fish host. They're metabolically pretty inactive. But they have a mouth because when they become adults, they're going to need to feed on the contents of the marine mammal gut. Um, and you can see that that mouth leads to an esophagus. There's this muscular part of the esophagus that's responsible for sucking things into the mouth. And that goes on to the rest of the intestines. Now, these guys, nematodes, are basically just tubes within tubes. They're a tube themselves. That external cuticle is really tough. It's part of what makes it possible for these guys to survive the chomping of vertebrate jaws in their passage down into the intestine. So they've got that t stiff cuticle. And hydrostatic pressure is what um, allows that worm to kind of do its wiggly movement that we would see if this guy is alive or was alive. And then within that cuticle, there's a tube of the intestinal tract, which has a mouth and an anus, and then also another tube for the reproductive tract. And these nematodes, they're either male or female, so either they'll have a uterus and ovaries, or they'll have testes. Um, and this guy's a little too young to tell what sex he is. He's also a little too young to easily tell what species he is, at least on this particular microscope. But we do know that he is a nematode in the family Anisacidae. And this guy is just a baby. They're in their larval stages when we find them in salmon. And as you saw from my talk a little bit earlier, what they're doing is basically biding their time. These little larval worms are waiting in that salmon to be passed on to their final host, a marine mammal host. Hard to tell uh, from this microscope whether we're dealing with a worm that infects cetaceans like whales and dolphins or a worm that infects pinnipeds, like seals and sea lions. But we know that this worm was found and determined to find itself in the intestine of some kind of marine mammal. And very sadly, he failed on his quest. There are literally billions of these little larvae in fish all over the world. It's a globally distributed parasite. It's in all kinds of different species of marine fish, not just salmon. And all of them, while they're in their fish host, are waiting, hoping for that final transition into a marine mammal host. If we were together in person, I would offer to put this worm in a jar as a paperweight or a knickknack for you to keep on your shelf and explain to your friends what he is. Um, but since we're not in person right now, look me up when you get to campus and I promise I'll have a worm waiting for you.